Good morning and welcome to this first instalment of the Radcliffe Chambers Commercial Insights webinar series entitled rather tantalisingly Civil Fraud Roundup 2023. I'm Zachary Kell and I'm speaking alongside Alexander Kingston Splat today. Both of us are specialists in civil fraud, commercial law and insolvency here at Radcliffe Chambers. I'm ranked as a leading junior for civil fraud and Alex is ranked as a rising star for insolvency in the legal 500. Today, we're going to hopefully illuminate this morning by looking at four of the key cases of 2023, which will show you the variety of civil fraud issues uh, that have come before the courts this year and hopefully help us to think forward into 2024 as to how we might approach these matters. Now, I'm going to do the rather technologically adventurous thing of sharing my screen and my slides. And let me just get that full screen right. So there we have it. Let's look at the cases. There are four, as I said today. First, I'll be looking at Philip and Barclays Bank, which came before the Supreme Court. I'll then turn to the Court of Appeals, Decision in Tradition, Financial Services and Bilter UK. Alex will then look at two High Court decisions. The first is the injunction in Perusida and Persons Unknown. And then finally, the case of Enigma Diagnostics Limited in liquidation v. Bolter and others. I want to begin with a very important recent Supreme Court decision on the scope of a bank's duties under Barclays Bank and Quinscare. In the context of where a bank's customer has been defrauded, yet authorised the underlying transaction in what's known as APP or authorised push payment fraud. Mr Justice Stain famously stated in Quinscare, quote, Trust, not distrust, is the basis of a bank's dealings with its customers. But how far does that take us? The facts of Quince Care, just for a brief recap, were these. Barclays had agreed to lend money to Quince Care for the purpose of buying four chemist shops. Quince Care's chairman, a Mr Stiller, instructed Barclays to transfer the funds purporting to be the drawdown of the loan to a firm of solicitors. In fact, Mr. Stiller instructed the solicitors to receive the money on his behalf and transfer it to a personal bank account, which he held in the United States of America. After Mr. Stiller had misappropriated the monies, Barclays sued Quincecare and the corporate guarantor of Quincecare's loan for repayment of the same. The defendants argued that Barclays had paid the monies in breach of its mandate or of a duty of care owed to its customer. And the key passage that came from Mr. Justice Stain's judgment at page 376 and was quoted by Lord Leggett recently in Philip at paragraph 46 was as follows, and it's up on your slide in brief. Given that the bank owes a legal duty to exercise reasonable care in and about executing a customer's order to transfer money, it is nevertheless a duty which must generally speaking be subordinate to the bank's other conflicting contractual duties. If the bank executes the order, knowing it to be dishonestly given, shutting its eyes to the obvious fact of the dishonesty, or acting recklessly in failing to make such inquiries as an honest and reasonable man would make, no problem arises. The bank will plainly be liable. But in real life, such a stark situation seldom arises. The bank will... Uh, the question is whether the lesser state of knowledge on the part of the bank will oblige the bank to make inquiries as to the legitimacy of the order. In judging where the line is to be drawn, there are countervailing policy considerations. The law should not impose too burdensome an obligation on bankers, which hampers the effective transacting of banking business unnecessarily. On the other hand, the law should guard against the facilitation of fraud and exact a reasonable standard of care in order to combat fraud and to protect bank customers and innocent third parties. The sensible compromise which strikes a fair balance between these competing considerations is simply to say that a banker must refrain from executing an order if and for as long as the banker is put on inquiry in the sense that he has reasonable grounds, although not necessarily proof, for believing that the order is an attempt to misappropriate the funds of the company. So key phrases there, put on inquiry, reasonable grounds for belief but not necessarily proof. 
On the facts of Quinscare, Mr Justice Stain held that there was nothing that in fact put Barclays on notice of Mr Stiller's dishonesty, and therefore the duty did not arise. Fast forwarding to more recent times, the facts of Philip were as follows. Mrs. Philip banked with Barclays. Her and her husband, Dr. Philip, were defrauded by a third party pretending to be a person working for the FCA in conjunction with the National Crime Agency. Sadly, Mrs. Philip was induced into transferring £700,000 from her current account to two accounts held in the United Arab Emirates. Upon being unable to recover the money, Mrs. Philip sued Barclays for breach of its duty under Quince Care for two reasons. First, by making the payments from her account, and second, in not taking adequate steps to recover the payments once the fraud had been discovered. And it's important to remember that distinction between the two limbs of the claim, as we'll discuss later on. The bank made an application for strikeout slash summary judgment, which was granted. Mrs. Phillip succeeded on appeal to the Court of Appeal, and the bank appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was faced with three questions. They're up on your slide. First, does the Quince Care duty have any application in a case where the relevant payment instruction was not issued to the bank by an agent of the bank's customer? The answer to this was no. As Lord Leggett explained, the duty to exercise reasonable skill and care only arises where the validity or the content of the customer's instruction is unclear or leaves the bank with a choice about how to carry out the instruction. In such cases, the duty of skill and care applies to interpreting, ascertaining, and acting in accordance with the instructions of the customer. Where the bank receives a valid payment order, as is the case in Philip, which is clear and leaves no room for interpretation or choice about what is required in order to carry out the order, the bank's duty is simply to execute the order by making the requisite payment. The duty of care does not apply. And in the case of Quince Care, Mr. Justice Stain was only concerned with a situation where the payment instruction was an attempt by a dishonest agent to misappropriate their principal's funds. The characterization in Philip as falling within what was decided in Quince Care was not accepted by the Supreme Court. But Lord Leggett went on to say that if the appropriate method for determining the scope of the bank's duty is by seeking to strike a sensible compromise or fair balance between competing policy considerations, then it is open to a litigant to seek to persuade the court that this balance favours extending the quince care duty or recognising a similar duty in cases of APP fraud. So the answer to the first question was no. The second question was if not, should either the quince care duty be extended so as to include the obligations contended for by Mrs. Philip in relation to APP, or alternatively, alternatively, the law recognise or impose such obligations on a paying bank as incidents of its duty to exercise reasonable skill and care in and about executing an instruction. The answer again to this was no. As Lord Leggett explains early on in his judgment at paragraph six, and I quote, the type of fraud which occurred here is a growing social problem and can undoubtedly cause great hardship to its victims, as the sad facts of this case make all too clear. Whether victims of such fraud should be left to bear the loss themselves or whether losses should be redistributed by requiring banks which have made or received the payments on behalf of customers to reimburse victims of such crimes is a question of social policy for regulators, government, and ultimately for Parliament to consider. And indeed, in the background to this, there is new legislation being considered by Parliament in relation to this type of fraud. Lord Leggett goes on to say, but it is not a question for the courts. It is not the role of the courts to formulate such policy, still less to impose on the parties to a contract an obligation to which they have not consented and cannot reasonably pres be presumed to have consented, since it is inconsistent with the normal and established allocation of risk and responsibility under contracts of the relevant type. So, so far, so good for Barclays Bank and its application. And that leads us to the third question. Should the court determine issues one and or two 
on a summary judgment slash strikeout application? The answer was unsurprisingly yes, but with a caveat. The court allowed the bank's appeal and restored the order of the judge at first instance, giving summary judgment in favour of Barclays. However, that order was varied by limiting the judgment to the dismissal of Mrs Phillips' claim insofar as it was based on the allegation that the bank owed her a duty not to execute her payment instructions. The court refused summary judgment in relation to her alternative case that the bank was in breach of duty in not taking adequate steps to attempt to recover the money transferred to the United Arab Emirates insofar as her case is based on inaction after the 27th of March 2018, i.e. after the bank was notified of the fraud for the first time by Mrs. Philip. So there are some clear conclusions to be drawn from this. Quince care cannot be extended in this remit, certainly not on these facts. An interesting point that arises, and it's uh, the subject of an article I'm working on with um, uh, James Morgan Casey in these chambers, is whether or not this could apply in the context of a cryptocurrency exchange. For example, Binance. Say you have an agent making a crypto transaction on their principal's behalf. Watch this space, because this is a point that was raised in the Tulip trading saga, which is due to go to trial, as we know, in the near future. But on the current reasoning and on the current approach that Lord Leggett sets out in the Supreme Court decision, it seems to be a very difficult argument to make indeed. Turning now to the second case I want to talk about, which is TFS and Bilter. And for those of you that heard my talk in September at Arundel House, do forgive me. I'm going to cover a lot of similar ground, but I would be remiss in leaving this case out of uh, our roundup of 2023. This is a case of note primarily for the way in which the court looked at the scope of Section 213 of the Insolvency Act 1986, which is a statutory claim for fraudulent trading, and the analysis of the scope of accessory liability in this context. Section 213 is to use the words of then Mr. David Foxton QC, now Mr. Justice Foxton, quote, the ultimate statutory encapsulation of the legal maxim fraud unravels all. The section provides that if in the course of the winding up of a company, it appears that any business of the company has been carried on with intent to defraud creditors of the company or creditors of any other person or for any fraudulent purpose, then the court on the application of the liquidator or also in the case of administration, the administrator in section 246ZA, which is in like terms, may declare that any persons who were knowingly parties to the carrying on of the business in the aforementioned manner are to be liable to make such contributions, if any, to the company's assets as the court thinks proper. Very broad indeed. Let's start by looking at the first instance decision of Mr Justice Marcus Smith and the general background to this case. This was a case in revolving around missing trader intra-community fraud, or MTIC fraud. An MTIC fraud is one which, as explained by Mr Justice Marcus Smith at paragraph 7 and 8, exploits the fact that imports from one EU country into another are VAT-free. The most basic form of MTIC fraud involves traders importing goods VAT-free from elsewhere in the EU, selling them within an EU country with VAT added to the sale price, and so running up large liabilities to account for the VAT to national revenue authorities, in this case, Her Majesty's or His Majesty's Revenue and Customs. These importers then default on their liability to, uh, liabilities to account for VAT, instead paying their VAT receipts away to third parties and going into insolvent liquidation. MTIC fraud thus concerns a failure on the part of the responsible company to account for its output VAT, which is, of course, the VAT that the company must calculate and collect when it sells goods or services. Output VAT is calculated both on the sales to other businesses and the sales to ordinary consumers. And traditionally, MTIC fraud involves things like the sale of SIM cards, early technology, early mobile phones, and the like. In TFS, the MTIC fraud involved, uh, as described by the judge at paragraph 10, spot trading and carbon credits under the EU Emissions Trading Scheme, or EUAs. 
One EUA represents the right to emit one metric ton of carbon dioxide or other specified gas. EUAs are required by so-called installations in energy intensive industries that emit carbon dioxide and are subject to obligations to comply with EU emissions rules. EUAs exist only in electronic form, are fungible and can be traded almost instantly. Spot trading in EUAs within EU member states attracted VAT back as far as 2009. Those rules changed when the authorities realised that EUAs were being used as the products in MTIC fraud. The claim against TFS was based on two primary limbs. Firstly, dishonest assistance in breach of fiduciary duty by the directors of the claimants. And secondly, participation in the fraudulent trading of the businesses of the claimants pursuant to section 213. The parties entered into a settlement agreement, which determined most of the issues, save for among other things, the question of whether TFS would be liable under section 213. TFS contended it would not because the section only applies to persons exercising management or control of the company's businesses, e.g. directors, shadow directors and the like. On that point, TFS placed reliance upon an article of Mr David Foxton QC, as he then was, from 2018 in the Journal of Business Law, which Mr Justice Marcus Smith described as, quote, compellingly and clearly written. One can see this from the conclusion alone, which reads, and I quote, In Hardy and Hanson, Mr Justice Menzies described the Australian equivalent of Section 213 as full of difficulties. The intervening 60 years have done little to lessen those difficulties, and the extension of Section 213 to outsiders as a species of accessory liability has merely served to enhance them. Given the increasing prevalence of cross-border fraud, it is probably unrealistic to expect the judiciary to row back from an interpretation of Section 213, which has produced a provision of such protean scope. No doubt it can be said that most of the difficulties raised in the course of this article can be accommodated within the exercise of the broad textured discretions available in determining whether the section should be invoked against those outside the jurisdiction and what, if any, relief should be ordered. However, the structural requirements for establishing private law rights and remedies and the rules which identify the system of a national law which determines what those requirements are, are not simply legacies of a more formal legal age, but serve important goals of certainty, consistency, and the protection of settled affairs. The coherence and distinctness of different legal categories is a legitimate objective of a system of law. The existence of a parallel, broad textured and delocalized regime alongside the rights created by private law, but only for a certain class of claimants, cuts across a number of those goals and should not be beyond reappraisal. Clearly, Mr. Foxton QC's concern here is well reasoned. There cannot be a statutory system of claims in fraud that extends far beyond what other classes of claimant would have, causing uncertainty and especially creating problems in the growing context of cross-border fraud arising from insolvencies, which may, for instance, be recognised under the Cross-Border Insolvency Regulations 2006 or other ways, statutorily or under the common law. Nevertheless, this analysis was not adopted in part because of a principle espoused by Mr Justice Templeman, as he then was, in Reed Gerald Cooper Chemicals Limited of 1978, where his lordship says, a man who warms himself with the fire of fraud cannot complain if he is singed. This essentially goes to the heart of accessory liability. Mr Justice Snowden, as he then was, felt compelled in Bilter and NatWest markets of 2020 to follow this principle, as it had been previously upheld by the High Court and the Court of Appeal, namely in Morris and Bank of India, first heard by Mr Justice Newberger, as he then was, and then in the Court of Appeal. In TFS, Mr Justice Marcus Smith found himself similarly unpersuaded that the analysis of the article was enough to decide differently, finding that the claim against TFS did not fall out with Section 213, although the learned judge indicated he was minded to grant permission to appeal on the point. An appeal was, in fact, brought by two of the claimant companies, which had been dissolved and later restored to the register by court order after the alleged fraud had occurred. They appealed 
against the dismissal of their claims of dishonest assistance, each contending that pursuant to section 1032 of the Companies Act 2006, the directors who had been in office at the date of dissolution were deemed to have remained in office during the period between dissolution and restoration, that since those directors had been involved in the fraud, their knowledge of the fraud could not be attributed to the relevant company. And this knowledge is, of course, relevant to the stopping of the limitation clock under Section 32 of the Limitation Act 1980. More relevant to our discussion, however, of the scope of fraudulent trading was that TFS cross-appealed that finding that Section 213 applied to it in this claim. In dismissing the cross-appeal, Lord Justice Lewison, giving the judgment of the court, held that the court was not bound by any authority on a wider interpretation of Section 213 and proceeded to carry out an exercise in statutory interpretation, looking at the underlying history of the section. Whilst the original scope of the civil law was a form of veil piercing that made company directors liable for the company's own debts, there had been a deliberate widening of the scope as far back as the Cohen Committee set up in 1945, which led to the development of the Companies Act 1947, and one of the first instances of what became Section 213. The purpose of Section 213 as it has evolved, Lord Justice Lewison explains, is not limited to veil piercing. It is to secure compensation for those who have suffered loss as a result of the fraudulent trading. Further, TFS argued that it's a precondition of liability that business had been carried on with fraudulent intent and that incidental frauds committed in the course of a business are not enough. The court accepted this as right, but made it clear that the claimant companies who had orchestrated the MTIC fraud were in fact carrying on business with fraudulent intent. The question is who else could be made liable? The recommendation of the Cohen Committee as far back as 1945 was that liability should be extended to those who participate in the fraud. Or to put it another way, liability extends to those who are party to the acts impugned, i.e. the fraud, a position that is similarly held by the Irish Supreme Court in O'Keefe and Ferris, in which Mr Justice O'Flaherty stated, uh, and, and which was quoted by Lord Justice Lewison, a person cannot be made amenable under the section unless he has actively participated in the management of the company. To impose liability on a shareholder, it must be shown that he took part in making management decisions which were intended to defraud creditors. A third party who knowingly participates in an act of fraudulent trading committed by a company's directors, for example, a creditor of the company who accepts payment of his debt out of money which he knows its directors have obtained by fraud, may be compelled personally to restore the money so applied by means of an order under the section, citing in Reed Cooper Chemicals. This observation, Lord Justice Lewison notes, also distinguishes between primary liability and accessory liability. The defendant further argued that there would be two potentially unsatisfactory consequences of adopting a wide interpretation of section 213. First, the question of limitation of actions, comparing the six year limitation period for dishonest assistance as opposed to true fiduciaries and citing the famous case of Williams and Central Bank of Nigeria. TFS argued that there may be a good reason why time should not begin to run under section 213 until a company is in the course of winding up as against those who are in control of the company's fraudulent business. The court dismissed this argument because those reasons do not apply to those who are no more than dishonest assistants. Even a fraudster, Lord Justice Lewison stated, is prima facie entitled to the benefit of a limitation period. Secondly, there was a technical point regarding insolvency set up under Rule 14.25 of the Insolvency England and Wales Rules 2016. Where a dishonest assistant was sued in equity, he would be entitled to set off any debt due to him by the company incurred before the onset of liquidation. Conversely, if sued under Section 213, no set-off is available, both because the liability cannot arise until the company goes into liquidation, and because set-off is not available in cases of malfeasance, and the case for that is Manson and Smith of 1997. The court dismissed these points as not providing a basis for the narrower interpretation, 
and also made it clear the scope of its judgment of paragraph 118, stating, I should make it clear, however, that nothing I say must be taken as setting the outer limits of the scope of section 213. All that we are asked to decide is whether a person cannot fall within the scope of section 213 unless he has a controlling or managerial function within the company. Whether an outsider can be said to be party to the carrying on by a company of a fraudulent business may well be a question of fact and degree, which requires careful analysis. That question does not arise in this case because of the settlement agreement. Lord Justice Lewison ultimately agreed with part of Mr. Foxton QC's conclusion in the article, namely, it's unrealistic to expect the courts to turn back from a wider interpretation of section 213 and accordingly dismissed TFS's appeal, therefore confirming the wide interpretation of parties liable under the section. To conclude on this case then, the Court of Appeal has confirmed in TFS that the scope of potential defendants is at the moment as wide as can be, not simply limited to directors, shadow directors and the like, but third parties who participated in the fraud. The question of whether a party can be caught in this way is always one of fact and degree, and will require careful analysis and advice before any such allegations are made. Now, you've all heard enough of my dulcet tones. Alex, would you like to kick us off with your discussion of Perosida? Thank you very much, Zach. So the first case I'm going to talk through is Perosida and Persons Unknown, uh, a decision of Mr Justice Trower that was handed down in March this year. Uh, this case is really a serious reminder of the duties of full, of full and frank disclosure and fair presentation, which apply to applicants and their representatives when seeking urgent junction, injunctions without notice or uh, on short notice. Uh, and also the need to distinguish between substantive wrongdoers on the one part and uh, institutional, as it were, bystanders on the other. So the facts were as follows. Uh, Mr. Perusida, who, for the sake of ease, I'll refer to these throughout this talk as the applicant, uh, alleged that he was induced by fraudsters who had made unsolicited contact with him via WhatsApp to transfer some 1.9 million Canadian dollars into two accounts in order to enable foreign exchange trading. Uh, that was to take place on an account that he was induced to open with one of the other respondents to this case, uh, OA Capital Holdings Limited. Uh, later, the applicant was induced to increase his trading with OA by transferring eight tranches of uh, cryptocurrency stablecoin Tether into four separate wallets that were used by OA, uh, totaling in all about 870 odd thousand uh, Tether. Uh, the applicant soon realised that he'd been defrauded when his attempts to withdraw funds from his trading accounts with OA were entirely unsuccessful. Uh, he then went about the process of trying to work out what had happened and before seeking urgent relief, sent out letters before claim in relation to the disappearance of the initial Canadian dollars. Uh, later, investigations agents found that it was possible to trace the tether into five wallets which were held by Binance Holding Limited. Uh, the operator of the Binance cryptocurrency platform, uh, and also a ninth respondent, OxK Fintech uh, Limited. Uh, now, eventually, on the without notice application, Sir Anthony Mann, sitting in retirement, made orders without notice against the first three respondents, substantive respondents, uh, uh, preventing them from dealing with Mr. Perugida's cryptocurrency, which had been transferred to the exchanges operated by Binance and OxK. Uh, he also ordered Binance to preserve roughly half of the 800,000 odd uh, tether or its traceable proceeds and Oxcase to preserve the balance. Uh, he also granted bankers trust orders uh, at the ex parte hearing uh, and they revealed the identity of the users in whose names these five accounts were held. Now they weren't said to be substantive parties to the fraud and so they were not joined to the proceedings whether at the interim stage or, or the substantive proceedings. Uh, all five of those accounts essentially had a zero balance uh, because they'd been emptied before uh, the orders were made by Sir Anthony. And so OxK's position at the return date was that it had, it had issued an application for reverse summary judgment on the claim to be heard at a later date. Having been served with the interim order and the substantive claim, Binance applied to uh, discharge the interim proprietary injunction made against it 
on two primary grounds. Uh, the first was that it should not have been made without any notice having been given to Binance at all. Uh, and the second was that uh, the applicant's legal representatives had failed in their duty of fair presentation to the court when obtaining uh, Sir Anthony Mann's order. The latter argument as to fair presentation included four sub-arguments, which we'll examine in uh, a bit of detail. Uh, the, the first was that Mr. Prusida uh, and his representatives at the hearing had not properly explained the defences that would be available to Binance. And in particular, he alleged that Binance stood in the position of being a constructive trustee. Uh, second, there was an inadequate explanation by the applicants as to why there was a sufficient risk that this alleged constructive trust may be breached by Binance, so as to warrant the grant of the injunction in the first place. Uh, third, he hadn't attempted to explain why damages would be an inadequate remedy so as in relation to Binance, so as to justify the order. And fourth, uh, rather importantly, he hadn't sought to explain how in practice Binance could actually comply with the order that Sir Anthony made. On whether the interim order should have been made without notice, Binance essentially argued that secrecy was unnecessary because the applicant didn't allege that Binance itself was guilty of any kind of wrongdoing. Mr. Peruzida's evidence essentially failed to distinguish between Binance on the one hand and the substantive alleged wrongdoers on the other. There was also no evidence that Binance would do anything which would prejudice Mr. Peruzida if it had been forewarned of the application whether by way of tipping off, off the substantive defendant or otherwise, uh, they argued uh, that uh, the obvious alternative would have been to proceed substantively against the main defendants uh, and serve Binance as a non-defendant, a non-respondent, a common approach uh, often taken in respect of banks. Now, at the return date, Mr Justice Trower held that this factor in isolation would not have justified uh, the discharge of the interim order, but he did conclude that it was essentially would have been better for Binance to have been served as a non-party, as it suggested. But what led to the discharge of the interim order that had been made against Binance was this, coupled with the failures of fair presentation of the case before Sir Anthony Mann. Uh, I mentioned earlier the point about Binance as constructive trustee. Now, this is probably the most serious failing related to the, uh, the uh, presentation of the case at the interim hearing. Uh, the transcript of that hearing revealed that Sir Anthony himself had raised doubts as to whether Binance was a trustee, essentially because it had no knowledge on the evidence of the fraud perpetrated on Mr. Perusida. In response at that hearing, it was argued that the initial wrongdoing itself was sufficient uh, for the trust to arise as against Binance. But unfortunately, this argument ignored the fact that the tether had moved out of the user accounts into a general pool, and in return for which the users uh, uh, were granted a credit equal to the value of what they had initially put in. This fact uh, was presented to the court at the initial stage, but the legal consequence of it uh, was not. Because the cryptocurrency had been swept away into a general pool, Binance effectively was in the position of a bona fide purchaser for value, equities darling, uh, without notice of the fraud, and so had an arguable defence to the constructive trust point. Uh, a further problem arose uh, in relation to the citation of another of Mr Justice Trower's cases that's mentioned on the slide, the lawyer, the person's unknown, during the course of last year, now, that was a case in which some of the same representatives of Mr. Peruzida had also appeared, but acting for a different claimant against Binance, among other people. Uh, and it was submitted that this decision held that exchanges, and Binance in particular, were constructive trustees. Uh, now, at the return date, Mr. Justice Trower noted that his own judgment in that case made no mention of the equities darling defence against Binance and that his decision in that case did not support the proposition that without anything more, exchanges could be constructive trustees. Also, by the time of the <clears throat> ex parte hearing, Binance in the other proceeding had made it clear to the same representatives that its method of working involved pooling of assets and that in those circumstances, it was likely to, to assert an equities darling defence. 
On the question of whether damages were adequate, uh, neither in evidence nor submission did Mr. Perosa do explain why a monetary award would be inadequate in respect of Binance. Um, indeed, even by the time of the return hearing before Mr. Justice Trowell, his case on the adequacy of damages, uh, Mr. Justice Trowell noted, remained entirely unclear. Uh, whilst Mr. Justice Trower acknowledged that this may have been a point which one may have expected Sir Anthony Mann to have asked himself before proceeding to make the original order, this in itself did not release uh, the applicant from his duty to explain the position to the court. Uh, as uh, Mr. Justice Trower noted by reference to the Dos Santos case, the second uh, mentioned beneath the first uh, argument on the slide, uh, in that case, Mr. Justice Popperwell said that the task of a judge on a without notice application in complex cases is not an easy one. Uh, he or she is often under time constraints, which render it impossible to read all of the documentary evidence on which the application is based, or to absor absorb all the nuance of what is read in advance. And then he went on to say in that case that it is essential to the efficient administration of justice that the judge can rely on having been given a full and fair summary of the available evidence and competing considerations which are relevant to the decision. And of course, it's the competing decisions, uh, which is the particularly germane point in the, uh, this case. Uh, so in short, but, uh, Mr. Justice Trower accepted all of Binance's submissions and so discharged the interim order as against it, uh, and also refused to exercise his di uh, discretion to grant the same relief afresh. So in terms of key points and takeaways from this case, uh, the first is that it's all too easy when making uh, a, an application for urgent injunctive relief to focus on the substantive wrongdoers and tar any other parties who may have received some of the proceeds of the wrongdoing with the same brush. So when considering the role of exchanges such as Binance, it's important to distinguish between substantive claims and remedies on the one half, uh, on the one hand, and on the other, things like Norwich Pharmacal and Bankers Trust relief. As Mr. Justice Trower observed, uh, Mr. Perusida and his advisors had lost sight of that distinction. And in reality, his interests were likely best served by the grants of the Bankers Trust orders and by serving Binance simply as a non-party. Uh, it's also in that regard important to note that we've come a long way since the uh, AB Bank and Abu Dhabi commercial bank case in terms of serving Bankers Trust and Norwich Pharmacal orders outside of the jurisdiction. There is the new procedural gateway, number 25 in practice direction CB, paragraph 3.1, which came into force on the 1st of October 2022. So the tools are available, uh, even in terms of smaller exchanges located outside of the jurisdiction. The second point is that it's really vital to consider which parties ought to be given at least short notice of the application, because convincing evidence would be required and always is required to justify the need to proceed in the absence of parties such as Binance. That evidence would need to be something to the effect that there was a demonstrable, provable concern that they may be tipping off, however inadvertent, of the substantive alleged wrongdoers. And really, if there's any doubt, serving an exchange or similar party as a non-party to the application is likely to be the safer course and the proper course, as Mr. Justice Trower, uh, Trower observed in this case. Uh, finally, it, really, the decision brings into sharp focus the care that is required in order to make fair presentation of the facts and law. Now, where proceeding against a particular institutional party, it's very important to research whether any specific defences have been advanced by them in similar cases previously, so therefore may well be advanced uh, in the, the case before you uh, that you're dealing with, if they were uh, present. It's very tempting to rely upon judges, often senior judges, to spot and interrogate all of the arguments which might be made on behalf of an absent defendant, but even a, hear even a hearing before the most experienced judge simply doesn't excuse the applicants or their representatives from making a full and fair presentation. And as it were, it will be totally inadequate at the return date to sort of blame the judge and say, well, really, uh, if this had been a concern, it wasn't raised at the interim hearing. Uh, that brings me to my second case and the final in our roundup of this year, 
and that is Enigma Diagnostic and Diagnostics and Bolter. Now, this was a decision of Mr. Just, uh, sorry, Mr. Nicholas Thompson, sitting as a Deputy High Court Judge, and it's a rare and successful application of the iniquity exception to the concept of legal professional privilege. Now, this can often be encountered in the context of civil fraud, um, because very often when disclosure of certain documents is uh, sought, a defendant will raise the, context, uh, the prospect of privilege and seek uh, to uh, withhold them. So the claimants in this case were Enigma Diagnostics in liquidation and also its liquidators. And in life, that company had been a startup that was engaged in developing medical diagnostic equipment. There were three defendants. One is Mr. Balter, uh, who we'll come on to in a moment. And the other is the law firm that was employed by him and his various companies, uh, DLA Piper UK LLP. Uh, finally, one of the partners of that firm, Mr. Charles Cook, uh, was the third defendant. In broad, uh, in broad terms, the claim alleged that Mr. Bolter had acted wrongfully in relation to his dealings with the shares of Enigma via a company called Porton Capital Limited, which I'll refer to as PCL. And that was a company owned and ultimately controlled by him, uh, based in the Cayman Islands. Mr. Bolter, in short, arranged for shares in Enigma to be issued to PCL and subsequently resold by PCL at a higher, uh, higher price. This is what the claimants described in their pleadings as the Enigma investment scheme. And their case was that Mr. Bolter did this whilst he and his company PCL were under either fiduciary or trustee or contractual duties to obtain the best price reasonably possible for the shares for the benefit of Enigma. And so they alleged that he and PCO had breached those duties. Now, the claims against Mr. Cook and DLA Piper related to their involvement in these arrangements, uh, which I'll touch on in a moment. Now, it wasn't in dispute that Enigma issued the shares to PCL, neither was it disputed that PCL sold the beneficial interest in those shares to third party investors, or indeed that PCL had remained on the share register as the nominee for those investors. Uh, the, the heart of the dispute was whether this was permissible without the uh, entire sale proceeds of the shares, less standard commercial commission, uh, being passed to Enigma, rather than keeping a substantial profit for itself. It was also alleged that Mr. Bolter had wrongfully carried out similar schemes of investment in relation to other companies, which were in the development stage, which were referred to in the uh, decision as the Porton Portfolio Companies. And again, DLA Piper was involved in relation to those. So the claimants applied for an order effectively to declare that <clears throat> um, privilege uh, in those uh, communications between DLA Piper and PCL and the other members of the company, uh, the Porton Group, were not privileged and correlating disclosure orders as well. Now, Enigma no longer had files, according to the liquidators, uh, or records relevant to these points. Uh, and Mr. Balter also claimed to have lost much of his documentation. So DLA Piper, in a sense, was left uh, holding the baby because it had retained its records and files. And so disclosure of those almost in its entirety, what their entirety was sought. Now, the claimants alleged that Mr. Balter and PCL could not rely on privilege due to the iniquity exception. And the allegation was that the schemes that I've described were in essence a fraud on the investors which purchased shares from PCL. Now, unsurprisingly on the application, Mr. Cook and DLA Piper took a neutral position. Uh, and Mr. Bolter, despite having been served, uh, said through his solicitors that he intended to take no part in it. Now, if one encounters this in practice, I, I would start with this decision because the judge collates much of the case law and provides a useful summary uh, of the principles to be derived from it. So the first point to note is the application was concerned with legal advice privilege rather than litigation privilege. But of course, those are simply two forms of the general legal professional privilege, uh, which applies uh, to solicitor and client correspondence. Now, the classic justification of legal professional privilege was given by Lord Hoffman in the uh, Morgan Grenfell and Co. Limited case that's mentioned on the slide, where he said that a fundamental human right 
uh, legal, advice, legal privilege is a fundamental human right long established in the common law, and that such advice cannot effectively be obtained unless the client is able to put all of the facts before the advisor without fear that they may afterwards be disclosed and used to his prejudice. Now, of course, solicitors have ongoing duties in relation to privilege, both in relation to uh, deceased clients and also clients that have been dissolved in the case of bodies corporate. But there's no privilege in a document which of itself is part of a fraud. Now, that was established, at least in the criminal context, as far back as 1884 in the Cox and Railton case that's mentioned on the slide. But as was confirmed in the uh, Abdi Azov saga litigation by Mr. Justice Popperwell back in 2014, the principle isn't confined to criminal purposes, but, quote, extends to fraud or other equivalent underhand conduct, which is in breach of a duty of good faith or contrary to public policy or the interests of justice. Now, importantly, the application of the iniquity principle or the iniquity exception doesn't depend on the conduct of the lawyers concerned. It doesn't even depend upon the lawyers having knowledge of the alleged iniquity in which they were caught up. Uh, but it's clear, or relatively clear from the cases, that the iniquity principle applies only in an exceptional case, uh, for the reason that Lord Hoffman described uh, in the Special Commissioner of Income Tax case that I mentioned a minute ago. And so the court is particularly slow to deprive a defendant of privilege on an interim application, as was confirmed in the uh, al Sadek and Deckert litigation also earlier this year. Now, unfortunately, there isn't a simple formulation uh, from the cases to determine the strength of a case that is needed to be shown in order for the court to overturn privilege on the grounds of iniquity. Um, but having looked at the case law, the judge concluded that it's at least necessary to show a strong prima facie case, or possibly even a, quote, very strong prima facie case in the majority of circumstances. So for the purpose of their application, the claimants didn't rely on the breaches of duty or contract or trust in order to allege that their amended particulars of claim uh, were sufficient to, uh, in their amended particulars of claim to uh, found the iniquity uh, principle. But they instead uh, based their application on evidence which they brought before the court that Enigma and the similar schemes that I've described involved a fraud on the investors. So effectively, the, the alleged fraud was that the investors were misled into thinking that the amount they paid for their shares in Enigma uh, or the other related companies would, apart from the standard commission I mentioned, um, go off to uh, Enigma rather than being retained or a large portion of it retained by PCL. Now, the weight of evidence that the uh, claimants put before the court was uh, fairly impressive and really goes some way to show how hard it is to convince the court, especially on an interim basis, that the iniquity principle uh, applies. Uh, firstly, they had direct witness evidence with communications to investors from PCL's then sales director to the effect that the money Porton was raising was intended to go to Enigma. That, the sales director said, is what he was told by Mr. Bolter, and that is in turn what he told the investors. There was also evidence from, albeit a fairly limited number of the hundreds of investors, of investors involved, to the effect that this is how they thought the money that they paid over was to be treated. Um, crucially, there were also contemporaneous emails in which Mr. Bolter himself had told various pers uh, prospective investors or their advisors that this is what would happen to their money. Uh, and also some of the application forms which were provided to investors uh, told them that DLA Piper was a global firm and that it, having received investment funds on behalf of Porson, would, quote, transfer those funds to Enigma. Taking this in the round, the judge held that whilst it was true that various holes could be picked in the body of evidence put before the court, and in particular in relation to the relatively few witness statements which were provided by seven out of hundreds of uh, total investors, some of whom were more convincing in their evidence than others. Uh, nevertheless, as a whole, the evidence presented a compelling case uh, as to the alleged fraud. 
And so the judge held, applying previous cases, that the body of evidence was sufficient to provide a very good arguable case that DLA Piper services were being used by PCL to assist it in a fraud on investors. So as I say, if this, if this argument is encountered in practice, this decision, which only runs for about 40 paragraphs, is well worth a read because it collects the cases and is a useful recent example of the applicable uh, principles being applied. And on that note, I think um, we come to the end of our webinar. Yes, um, no, that, 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 that's fantastic. I hope that's been um, somewhat illuminating for, for, for all of you. Um, we're coming up to the hour. So in terms of questions and answers, if, if, um, if Alex, you go to the next slide, I think there's our, yes, there's our email addresses there. So if you've got any questions at all arising out of this talk or, or anything that you would like to, to, to bounce around as an idea with us, please send us an email. Um, you're more than welcome to. And we're happy to continue the discussion um, thereafter. But thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you.